between two of our leading contemporary biographers. My name, for those who don't know me, is Michael Kellyan from Wimbledon Synagogue, who have organized this evening's talk. Before I hand over to Anne, I would just like to mention something about the Q&A at the end. We've already received some anecdotes and questions in advance, but for those on Zoom, feel free to ask any of your own, preferably initially on chat with your name so our hosts can find you to, and you can ask them yourselves. Please also remember to unmute yourself when Anne introduces you. Over to you, Anne. You're muted, Anne. That's it. You're all Thank now. you. Yes, no, I knew, but you weren't allowing me to unmute. Here I am. So sorry about that. Hello and a very good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome from me. It's wonderful to have so many people listening and joining us tonight, including a large number, I think, who had personal dealings or memories of Maxwell. I think that's testament to what a great book this is about a truly unbelievable character. You see, they want to know even more. So I'm Anne Seba. I'm an author and fellow biographer. And so, John, I'm absolutely full of admiration for how you tackled this complicated and at times deeply unpleasant story. Um, but my credentials for doing this interview tonight are also that I know personally some of the Maxwell family. I grew up um, as a child alongside the family when they lived in Isha, <coughs> long before they moved to Oxford. And my parents were friendly with Bob and Betty, as they were known then. Uh, when I say friendly, that's not entirely accurate. Um, for my parents to encounter so soon after World War II, a man so evidently Jewish who denied his Jewishness was actually a heinous crime. Um, even as a child, I remember how deeply scornful they were of his boastfulness that he would become prime minister one day. And that's a story you quote in the book, although not quoting my parents. So he obviously said it to lots of people. Um, and there were other things too, perhaps we'll come on to some of them. Um, but what I also remember is that we went on seeing them and it wasn't because they were famous, they weren't in those days. So, in fact, my sister and I remain friendly with the children today. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there was a kind of magnetism, an aura of magic dust, which really never quite went away. Um, but I just want to say also by way of introduction that even if I hadn't had this personal contact, I would have fallen upon this book. And for those of you who don't know, it's called The Fall. I urge you all to rush out and read it and buy it because it really is so gripping, so unputdownable. Um, and if you want to, Michael's going to give you details of how to do that at a special rate after this session. You will gasp and choke at various points of the as the story is revealed. So finally, let me introduce you to best-selling author John Preston, who's been waiting patiently while I said my little bit. Um, his previous two books have both made it to the screen, as I'm quite sure this will too. Um, a very English scandal about Jeremy Thorpe or the Jeremy Thorpe affair, and The Dig, which is a novel based on a family member of his. Before writing these hugely successful books, John was a former arts editor at the Evening Standard and Sunday Telegraph, um, and for a decade, The Telegraph's TV critic. 
um, and one of its chief feature writers too. So, John, the first question has to be, what drew you to want to write about such a difficult, criminal, narcissistic character? And are you attracted to people who tell lies and cover their tracks? What interested you in this larger-than-life character? And what did you know before you started? Well, the short answer to that is not an enormous amount. I remember having a lunch with the producer of a very English scandal, I think after it had been made. And they were kind of casting around for some, some uh, another subject. And I think he mentioned Maxwell. And I said in a rather kind of airy way, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think there's anything worth doing there. And then I went home and I thought about it and I said, mm, actually, I'm completely wrong. It is a fascinating subject. And I also knew Ian Maxwell. In fact, I was at school with him. And I we met and I talked about it. And I was kind of, I'd always been fascinated by Maxwell because I, I caught the tail end of Fleet Street in the late 80s. And although I didn't work for Maxwell, he was a sort of unavoidable presence on Fleet Street. And he seemed to be simultaneously feared and ridiculed, often by the same people. So that interested me. And, and I remember when he died, it was such an extraordinary story that you had all these kind of world leaders queuing up to pay tribute to him. And then it was really only about a fortnight later that the same people were saying, you're equally queuing up to denounce him and saying, oh, I always knew he was a kind of wrong one. Um, and I felt that, I felt that enough time had gone by. I mean, it's now 30 years since he died. And it fascinated me that he's still seen as the kind of embodiment of corporate villainy because he did this plainly heinous thing, which was to loot 350 million pounds from the mirror pension funds, thereby depriving a lot of people of the prospect of a tranquil and reasonably prosperous retirement. And it seemed to me that so much kind of black paint had been tipped over his reputation that he'd been turned into a kind of pantomime baddie. And I wanted to examine him and see if he really was as black and villainous as history had painted him, or whether he was perhaps a more nuanced, complex figure than that. And it was that last um, phrase, a more complex figure, not exactly rehabilitating him, I don't think, um, although I'm sure it required all your skills as criminal barrister as well as detective to undertake this book, um, and literary skills as well. I mean, it's unbelievably readable. The way you tell the story is extraordinary. But um, by... Trying to rehabilitate him, I know that you had some family cooperation, and I'm sure that was terribly important at a certain level. But um, I guess, in a way, it's also a hindrance. I mean, I, I think one can say as a biographer, the last people to understand their parents, and certainly their parents' sex lives, are the children. They're simply the, the worst witnesses to you, you know they they can't possibly know but also did you to some extent feel that by knowing Ian for since way back and by having some family cooperation you had to employ any kind of self-censorship how, how did that work in practice in other well, words? Well I mean I'm just to answer that slightly indirectly I'm just I mean when I did a very English scandal. I spent a lot of time talking to Norman Scott, who Jeremy Thorpe had tried to, they had, obviously had a homosexual affair and Thorpe had tried to get him bumped off. And I, I didn't feel in any way compromised there because to be perfectly honest, 
felt like killing Norman Scott myself by the time I'd finished with him. Um, so I didn't, so, and in terms of, I certainly didn't have that kind of relationship with, with Ian Maxwell. I mean, I, I, I had no interest actually in trying to rehabilitate Maxwell's reputation. Um, but nor did I have any interest in judging him. I, I feel that I, it's possibly a legacy of having worked as a journalist for so long, where you invariably end up pointing an accusing finger at someone or other. I feel that when I've come to write books, that it isn't my role to judge people. Mm. It's my role insofar as one can do it, and plainly one can't be entirely objective, is to lay things out as objectively as possible and let readers make up their own minds. And I do remember saying to Ian when we first discussed this, um, I, and I said, I'm not going to try and rehabilitate your father's reputation because I don't think it can be done and I don't want to do it. I'm not, you know, a professional apologist or anything like that. But I did say I do want to try to humanize him because, and this goes back to my earlier point of him being having having been turned into a kind of pantomime villain. And, and as I say, I do feel that he was a much more tangled, nuanced, ultimately tragic figure than that. And that absolutely comes across, as does the feeling that I, I got from reading the book, but perhaps you feel to an extent you didn't want to hurt them, they'd suffered enough. But um, there's this terribly moving story that, um, you know, where, where you have, I think it's Ian who comes into his father's room and sees his face close to the television screen and says to his father, what on earth are you doing? And he says, well, I'm trying to see, I'm watching old newsreel of the Jews being sent to Auschwitz, trying to see if my parents are there. But um, you'd probably tell that story much better than, than me. But I wondered if we could go back to the beginning, actually, yeah. and how he started his life and how this dirt poor um, shtetl beginning where he didn't have enough for shoes, uh, tell us about his origins. Well, uh, yes. I mean, this is one of the things that fascinated me at Matt Maxwell. It was that it's hard to think of anyone else, really, in the 20th century who journeyed as far from his origins as Maxwell did. I mean, he was born, as you say, uh, to a very, very poor Jewish family in a town in the in what was then Czechoslovakia, and. When Maxwell was 18 in 1939, 16, I beg your pardon, um, he left the village and went off sort of partly to seek his fortune and possibly to fight in the war, which he subsequently did. And while he was away, both his parents, three of his siblings, both his grandparents, all died in Auschwitz. And you spoke earlier about how he was a, a self-denying Jew, certainly in the 1950s, and indeed for much longer than that. Nonetheless, I, I think that the prism of what the, the what the experience of what happened to his family is, as it were, the prism that you have to look at Maxwell through. And he joined up with the Czech Free Forces, which were then subsumed into the British Army, and throughout throughout the war maxwell has been dreaming of getting hold of a commodity for next to no money that's going to be in huge demand after the war and you know it's going to be make his fortune and one day in berlin he's sitting in his office he's running an, a newspaper for the allies to as it were reintroduce berliners to the joys and virtues of democracy and this man walks into his office who says, I've got a problem, can you help me? And he turns out to be the largest publisher of scientific journals in Germany. And no one has published anything in Germany throughout the war. So he has a huge backlog of stuff. And Maxwell suddenly thinks, oh my God, the commodity I've been dreaming of for so long has just landed in my lap. And that vast stockpile of scientific journals 
becomes the cornerstone of Maxwell's publishing empire. And by the end of the 50s, he is the largest publisher of scientific journals in the world. Mm. I mean, what you've said is extraordinary, this journey. And your book isn't just a biography. It is, of course, a history because he makes this incredible journey. And by the time he buys up um, this newspaper, he's already gone to Paris. He's met this former school teacher, Elisabeth Mena. He's managed to source her dress from parachute silk and they're married. It's, it's an ex everything he does is larger than life and with extraordinary speed. Um, so does he make money? I mean, this is what I really need you to explain. It, it feels as if, you know, one minute he's killing somebody, watching other people being killed and has nothing. And the next minute he's on the way to being a multimillionaire. I mean, is it really as fast as that? No, well, it, it was pretty fast, but Maxwell was one of the, I mean, Maxwell could have made money out of selling mud. I mean, he really, you know, as a boy, he'd, he'd sold trinkets in the village and he, he had a kind of genius for it. Um, and he was selling all kinds of stuff when he first comes to London, apart from scientific journals, he was also selling kind of dried sardines and things like this. Um, but one of the things that's fascinating is that, is that yes, you're right. He, he did make money very quickly. He was aided to a large extent by, in the early years, by British intelligence. He'd worked as a spy in Berlin for the British. Berlin then was a divided city. Um, there was the Russian zone, the American zone, the English zone, the French zone. Maxwell, who had this astonishing capacity for uh, soaking up languages, could pass himself off as a native and move from occupied zone to occupied zone. So it was a huge asset for British intelligence. And he, you know, by the time he was 23, he changed his name four times. So he not only had this great apt aptitude for subterfuge, but he plainly loved it. Um, and when he came to London, he, you know, publishing is still a fairly sort of genteel, antiquated profession today, although nothing like what it was. Um, I mean, Maxwell was like this absolute tornado in British publishing in, in the late 40s and 50s. They, and these particularly scientific publishing, I mean, they'd never seen anything like him before. Um, and he took it, you know, completely by the scruff of the neck. And, it, and, and as it were, money came out. But I think one has to bear in mind that, you know, it's, it's very easy to see Maxwell as this figure who was solely fixated on his profit margins. And, but that's actually only part of the story. He was genuinely fascinated by science and by the scientific research that he published. He was revered by a lot, most of the scientists whose work he published. He in giving these people a platform to disseminate their research, he paved the way for a lot of kind of key breakthroughs in medicine, chemistry, physics. And, you know, it's just worth bearing in mind that had Maxwell died in, say, 1961 rather than 1991, he would have been remembered in a very, very different way as someone mm. who really had, um, you know, made a big contribution to, as it were, progress. A pioneer. That's so interesting what you say about money not being the only motive for him. I mean, I don't expect you to, to become an, an, an amateur psychiatrist, but clearly the war was very important in, in not only informing him, but informing other people's views of him. So a lot of people felt, well, this fantastic war hero and the picture you have of, of this terribly handsome man having a medal pinned on him, is it speaks volumes for how he uh, got a leg up, as it were, and how people trusted him because he'd had such an extraordinarily brave war. So my question is, in terms of 
killing somebody. To what extent do you believe that having killed somebody, he, he nothing held any fear for him? I mean, I'm sure there are other factors too, and perhaps I've oversimplified it, but if you look no, at no, his I ruthlessness. I think he was unquestionably extremely ruthless, as you say. He actually shot the mayor of a town in um, in in France in cold blood. I mean, he shot him in the middle of the town square to no. basically discourage the townsfolk for uh, taking up arms against the British. And there's pretty compelling evidence that he shot German soldiers who had actually surrendered and were unarmed. Um, he by this stage didn't know the full story of what had happened to his family but he knew certainly some of it so he was unquestionably vengeful in that sense um you know it's terribly difficult to work out you know let's just say hypothetically maxwell's family hadn't been essentially wiped out in auschwitz would he have been a very different character? Well, yes, probably. But, you know, one can't, it's terrible. You know, it's wildly oversimplistic to say mm -hmm. that he would have been less ruthless. Um, it was a contributory factor to his ruthlessness. But I don't think it kind of, you know, incubated it from scratch, as it were. Um, I think he was... I think he had a, he, would, he was brought up with a very, very harsh dog eat dog mentality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that's so complex. We, we will only be able to scratch the surface for some of these issues. But I mean, you couldn't have found a richer, more complex personality to deal with. And I hope we can touch on on some of the the, the real characteristics. And, and as I said in, in my little piece at the top, so many people have stories about him and, and who met him. And that's largely in later years, you know, certainly people who are still alive and with us today. Um, and so people tend to think that the real fraud was in the last few years, but actually was it because of course, in 1971, if I've got the date right, he was declared not fit to run a public company. I mean, uh, moving along, why did so many otherwise high-powered, intelligent people, dignitaries, bankers, politicians, get involved with him and not look further? I mean, I've marked a page in, in, in 169 in your book about all the billions that he had salted away in Liechtenstein and the Sunday Times rich list for 1989 to 90 had estimated Maxwell's fortune at between 1.2 billion and 1.5 billion. Um, what's more, he'd done something that counted just as much as any number of bank statements, accounts or written guarantees. He had given them his word. That's what you say. I, I can't really believe that simply giving them his word was enough. I mean, according to Bronwyn Maddox, he had 800 companies. I mean, devious or what? How well, he was incredibly devious, but I mean, to, to, to go back to your original point, you're absolutely right that everybody, almost everybody who ever had any dealings with Maxwell has a story about him. Now, <laughs> Maxwell himself was a colossal mythomaniac and whenever he would tell a story about himself he would always add as it were kind of an extra layer of varnish on top but the interesting thing is that when you strip the layers of varnish off the stories are still perfectly good in their own right i mean they don't really need embellishment and i realized quite early on when i was doing research and and people would tell me stories about maxwell some of which were patently untrue. But in a funny sort of way, it didn't really matter that they were untrue because they still told you a lot about how people perceived Maxwell. And I remember, I remember when I was a child, my mother gave me what I always thought was a completely invaluable piece of advice, which was, 
people take you at your own valuation of yourself. And I think that is true. And in Maxwell's case, he valued himself incredibly highly. And there were people in the city only too happy to subscribe to Maxwell's vision of himself. Now, they wouldn't have been happy to do that if he hadn't made them a lot of money with, at one stage. And, you know, Maxwell was at various stages in his career hugely successful. So um, one can't take that away from him. Um, you know, he may have played fast and loose with the rules and all the rest of it, but he made, and to some extent were lost or had taken away from him, a number of fortunes. Um, and it's really only, as you say, yes, that he was declared an unfit person to run a public business in, uh, I think, 1971 by the Department of Trade and Industry. But nonetheless, he fought his way back within four years and, and bought back Pergamon um, and seemed, as it were, to have restored his reputation. Um, and the, 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 the rot, as it were, sets in when Maxwell becomes obsessed with owning a newspaper. Having tried to become an MP, and as you say, decided he was going to be prime minister before he became an MP. Um, and he was the Labour MP for Buckingham, and he would get his chauffeur to drive him from London in his Rolls Royce to the edge of the constituency, where Maxwell would uh, get the chauffeur would then change into a kind of beaten up old rover. But and then he would, Max would be driven, still chauffeur driven, with a kind of chauffeur with a cap on, around the the, the uh, Buckingham, uh, just sort of proclaiming his man of the people credentials. Um, but when he got to Parliament, I think he was very surprised that he wasn't given quite the kind of rapturous reception that he'd anticipated. Um, he, in fact very quickly got a reputation for being this colossal blowhard. And there are extraordinary uh, stories of his fellow Labour MPs trying to get him to shut up and actually sort of hanging onto his jacket, trying to sort of drag him back into his seat because he would give speeches at the drop of a hat on anything. Um, and I think it did, for one of the very few occasions in Maxwell's life, dawn on him that he wasn't necessarily cut out for this. So he, having kind of been thwarted in one route to power, he then took another route, which was through trying to own a newspaper, but then he was thwarted for a long time, every step of the way, by the man who became his kind of arch nemesis, who was Rupert Murdoch. Hmm. I, well, I guess just to, to pin you down on, on this fraud, if I can, I mean, it's, for, for me, it's, it's very complex. But do you believe that really, I mean, I'm absolutely with you in what you say about the greater truth. I think there is sometimes the greater truth and clearly Maxwell embodies that. But that isn't quite enough. I mean, was it just that these companies or were so tangled up either in Liechtenstein or the ownership led to another ownership. And, you know, clearly these fine brains of analysts were working and struggling to unravel these 800 yeah. companies and where the ownership lay. I mean, was it that it was just so complex and devious and obfuscating? Or was it actually that people wanted to believe him because he was at one level quite credible or a mixture I think, of the two. I, I, you know, I, to give you an incredibly mealy-mouthed answer, I think it was a combination of the two. Um, I mean, as you say, of those 800 companies, Maxwell had this kind of, again, it was a sort of genius where he would call one company sort of Maxwell Holdings Incorporated. And then another one would be called kind of Maxwell Holdings International, and another one would be called Maxwell Holdings International Incorporated. And people would try, to, I mean, they, as you say, they would get absolutely bewildered by this vast kind of tangled network. And then if they did finally negotiate their way through it to some extent, 
they came up against this brick wall, which was Maxwell continually said, I've got millions stashed away in Liechtenstein. And, you know, no one could disprove it because, you know, having money stashed away in Liechtenstein, you know, it was like having money in Switzerland. And there was no access to any accounts. So, you know, and at one point he did have billions stashed away in Liechtenstein, but of course, by the time he died, it had all gone. And of course, the, the real crime for which he will never be forgiven is taking money from the mirror pensioners. But at a certain level, that wasn't wholly illegal, as I no, am. Absolutely. No, you're completely right. As long I mean, as you was... made clear that you intended to repay it, it's different now. But yeah, it was a very, very fuzzy area in terms of yeah, the legality of it. And Maxwell, in fact, had been taking money out of the mirror pension funds for quite a long time. I mean, he bought the mirror in 1984 and almost immediately uh, started taking money out of the pension funds and then actually reinvesting it rather shrewdly and paying it back. And the pensioners, because they had done quite well out of it, had no cause for complaint. It was really only when the cracks it's not until 88, really, that the cracks start to widen. And Maxwell engages in this kind of ever more frantic round of robbing Peter to pay Paul, of taking money out of one bit of his empire, which is doing well and using it to shore up another bit that's not doing well. And, you know, creative accountancy, like you know, <laughs> you've never seen. Um, and and by then, of course, actually, it's too late because the cracks are already starting to widen and no amount of kind of shuffling money around can disguise that. I have to say, I, I was so consumed by those pages and, and the image of the facts running over and over and over. And yeah. you, know, you had to tread over. Uh, you kept me awake at night when I was reading that. It was just so horrifying and terrifying and letters not opened. Um, but I'm sure there'll be some questions about the money. So I'd like to, the financial aspect of his life, I'd like to talk a little bit about his private life. It seems mm. to me nobody until you has really talked about his affairs. Um, and you do that in great detail. His marriage to Betty was really over as, almost as soon as they moved to Oxford. Um, my question is, why didn't she divorce him? And would you say that actually she colluded, not in the financial scandal, but in the public image, really? I mean, the story about when she says she's going to divorce him and they agree to meet on, yeah. on the yacht and he never turns up, it's horrific. I mean, it's a nightmare. I wondered how you, uh, um, what, what your understanding of, of their marriage was and his private life. I think they had a very good marriage to begin with. In fact, if you read their love letters to one another, they're extremely romantic and passionate and tender. Um, they had nine children um, and, you know, Maxwell was away a lot in the 1950s uh, on business. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he had affairs then, but actually Betty was pretty relaxed about that. Um, it's really only um, in 19, I think it's 63, um, Michael, the oldest son, uh, and this happens in, I think, the same week that Ghislaine, the, the youngest child, uh, daughter, was, was born. Michael, who was the heir apparent, uh, who was then about uh, 17, 18, was being driven back to Oxford from a party, um, and it was a very bad car crash. The car smashed into a, a lorry which had parked, which had no lights, um, and Michael... Uh, sustained extremely bad head injuries and was in a coma for the next seven years before he died. And that's really the point at which this kind of black 
cloud settles over the family that never goes away. I mean, up until that point, Maxwell had been quite a draconian father, but, you know, attentive and devoted. Um, but it's, I think that's, it's the point, everything starts to fracture. I think the marriage starts to fall apart. Um, I mean, it's fascinating that Betty was under the impression that throughout the time, those seven years that Michael had been in a coma and he was in a hospital that was really only a mile away from where the family lived in Headington Hill Hall. Um, Betty thought that Maxwell never went to see Michael. But in fact, that's not true. I spoke to Maxwell's former chauffeur and quite regularly, the chauffeur would drive Maxwell down late at night from London back to Oxford. And Maxwell would say, are you doing anything? And the chauffeur said, well, no, not particularly. So they, and say, let's go to the hospital. And Maxwell would sit by Michael's bed, talking to him, trying to elicit some reaction. And, you know, that begs the obvious question, why didn't he tell Betty? And I can only think that he couldn't face her seeing his vulnerability. It was too agonizing for, for him, and he felt that he had to keep it from her. Uh, but at the same time, it gives you an idea of this kind of wedge that was increasingly driving them apart into, as it were, kind of secret worlds, I think. Um, and, and I don't think Betty, I wouldn't say she colluded with him. I mean, yes, she did kind of, to some extent, sustain Maxwell's image. And, and the, the, the image that he, he projected was, of course, extremely important to him. But I think her feeling was that she had to try, she was determined to try to keep the family united insofar as it was possible. Mm. Uh, so that's what she saw as her great role. And, and it's very interesting that when Maxwell as it were, rediscovers his Judaism in the late, in the mid 1980s, that Betty turns herself into an extremely respected scholar of Holocaust studies to try to understand better the forces that had shaped Maxwell. And she was constantly trying to work out why Maxwell was so beastly to her. And he would he would belittle her in public and uh, humiliate her and really treat her appallingly. And her explanation, which I don't entirely buy, but I still think it's very interesting that she fixed upon it, was that Maxwell, having rediscovered his Judaism, took it out on her for not being Jewish. But actually uh, he'd failed to bring a Jewish family. Exactly. He, he often said that the yeah. reason for so many children was to recreate his family. And then exactly. he realized that he hadn't recreated his Jewish family because yeah. their mother was, was Catholic. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievably cruel um, to take that up. Well, you've gone mute. I think you've still gone mute. You should be able to oh, unmute no. now. How about that? Uh, Judy, can you unmute Anne? Can I unmute Anne? I can only ask. Uh, what's happened? Anne has got a little, wait a minute. Uh, and you should be able to unmute. She's trying, but it's not working. Uh, I've made her a co-host. She should be able to unmute. Uh. Okay. Has that worked? Yes, absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know how 
gremlins got in and we were just having this really fascinating conversation about his cruelty and the way he belittled and humiliated Betty publicly. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it was simply being Catholic that prevented her from divorcing him. It seems to me that she stayed in love with him for a lot longer than he remained in love with her. Is that your understanding? Yes, I think so. Actually, she was a she came from a kind of Huguenot Protestant family. And I mean, yes, she was, I think that, I think that probably the reason that Maxwell was so horrible to her, I think he blamed her for not being more like his mother, who was the one person in life who treated him with absolutely unquestioning devotion. And, and in the same way that she, he couldn't face the idea of Betty seeing how vulnerable he was about his, their son, Michael, I think that he took it out on her because she wasn't under any illusions about Maxwell and she knew just how vulnerable he was. And the older Maxwell became, and to some extent, the more insecure he became, uh, the more he kind of clung to this public image of himself that he tried to put over in the Daily Mirror, where he was constantly, the, the paper would be constantly running large pictures, photographs of Maxwell everywhere. And it's as if he tried to become that public persona. Um, but the private persona was a much more fragile, vulnerable figure. Yes, I was just going to use that word. I think you've talked about his engaging vulnerabilities, or I've seen it somewhere. Um, and I just wonder, in, in the context of the other women to whom he was attracted, do you think it, it was a fantasy, or do you think he really did fall in love with the, the younger women that, that you... Well, he, be, he became absolutely besotted with a woman called Andrea Martin, who was his PA, at the um at the mirror who was about 40 years younger than him um and he it's very interesting to question did he fall in love with her or was it a kind of it was almost a sort of late middle-aged adolescent infatuation um i mean he certainly adored her. Um, I mean, he. One of the the things about Maxwell was that if you look at photographs of him as a young man, he was extraordinarily good looking. Yeah. There's a fascinating document I found in the Secret Service archives in Prague, where he goes back to Prague at some stage in the fifties. And they know that he's a spy for British intelligence. And there's a memo that someone in Czech intelligence wrote to presumably for the, the benefit of the whoever was um, had been detailed to follow Maxwell and basically said, you won't have any difficulty recognizing him. he looks exactly like Clark Gable. And, you know, he was this kind of very handsome, charismatic man. And then the older Maxwell becomes he becomes this sort of bloated wreck, really. Um, and I think, you know, it's almost as if in coming, becoming besotted with this woman so much younger than himself, he was to some extent trying to reclaim his younger self. Um, and he's, he wanted to marry her um and they certainly did have an affair albeit briefly um and the fact that she then went off and subsequently married the mirrors mm. foreign editor was another of the things that kind of tipped him over the brink um i mean you know the, 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 the 
I often, it, fe- I often felt when I was re- sorry. I beg your pardon. Sorry. No, I, w- I thought you finished. Sorry, I was. No, 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 I thought, thought I'd finished as well. Actually. It's almost. Tra- I mean, your description of that relationship it verges on tragic comedy almost. But, but yes, I mean, I I felt you know often when I was writing this book, it felt like a kind of odd mixture of Citizen Kane, The Great Gatsby, and King Lear all kind of mashed together. And well, that's quite an achievement. And you know, and the story of Maxwell, it, it, you know, it's like this kind of terrible morality tale mm. of someone for whom nothing was ever enough. You have this sense of Maxwell as he gets older, he's kind of reaching for this indefinable something that will bring him a kind of measure of contentment and fulfillment. And of course, he never gets it. And it's as if he's, you know, no amount of, you know, power, wealth, influence, food, sex, drink, anything is going to kind of going to fill this sort of Mm. aching void at the heart of him. Um, I'm very conscious that I know lots of people want to ask questions. So this is going to be my last, I think. Um, You mentioned that Ghislaine, their youngest child, was born the year that Michael had his terrible accident. I know Ghislaine is not the subject of your book, and it's actually probably sub judice anyway, but can we discuss his relationship with his children a little bit? Hmm. Um, I wonder if you might want to, or you might feel that Ghislaine is paying the price for the sins of the father. Um, if, if you don't want to talk about Ghislaine, I, I wonder if you believe the children could have stood up to him. I mean, certainly Philip and Anne kept out of his way and refused, but Kevin and Ian were sucked in. So I just, can you talk about his relationship with the children a little bit? I think, and this is particularly towards the end of Maxwell's life, as uh his daughter Christine said, you know, by the end, my father had megalomania and he pushed everyone away. And hence his kind of awful isolation. I mean, I think he, he you know, he was, he was like a sort of Victorian paterfamilias as well. And they would have these kind of terrible lunches, Sunday lunches at Headington Hill Hall. And each child in turn would have to give a little speech about you know what they'd accomplished in the previous week what they hoped to accomplish in the following week and also to kind of talk about issues of the day and isabel said you know you'd sit there you'd see you know your father's gaze would kind of move around the tables like it's got a terrible searchlight beam getting closer and closer i think Ghislaine was probably better at charming her father and diffusing his rages or his disapproval than any of the other children. Um, You know, I'm very skeptical of kind of attempts to sort of yoke together Jeffrey Epstein and, and, and Robert Maxwell because they're two completely different figures. You know, I mean, Maxwell had to dominate any room that he walked into, whereas Epstein it seems to me, was a much more kind of behind the arras sort of figure. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about that. And I also feel, you know, to throw in what is possibly a rather unfashionable viewpoint, that, you know, Ghislaine, whatever she may or may not have done, deserves a fair trial. And I don't think the way things are going, she's unlikely to get one. Um, and so I um you know keeping my powder dry my moral powder dry if such yeah. a thing but can you do to have exist. a very interesting quote about gillen who said that whatever my father has done he was not a crook i don't want to paraphrase you yeah um, a thief to me is somebody who steals money do i think my father did that no i don't know what he did obviously something happened did he put it in his own pocket did he run off with the money? No. And that's my definition of a crook. So well, I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, I, I, and again, you know, I think that, you know, plainly what Maxwell did was very wrong. 
and I'm not in any way trying to, to, to you know pretend otherwise. But I think he wasn't a kind of Bernie Madoff figure who was solely interested in lining his own pockets. Maxwell, to some extent, I mean, of course, he enjoyed the fruits of wealth, but not to that extent. I mean, he had no interest in possessions. You know, the, the house in Headington was actually, you know, owned by Oxford Council. It was a council house in theory. Um, and I do feel that had he been in a position to pay the money back into the mirror pension funds, he would have done because that's what he'd done in the past. But, you know, plainly, he was overtaken by events in that sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, again, you know, also Maxwell clearly was a monster in some respects. Uh, I just happen to think that he was ultimately a very tragic monster. Well, that's a very good note on which for me to open it up to questions. The first question I'm going to read, because I've been asked to, um, from Leon Smith. And he asks, do you know exactly what, if anything, Maxwell was doing for Mossad that resulted in him having a funeral which almost resembled a state funeral? It appears that the two things that caused Maxwell to embrace his Jewish identity again were meeting Gerald Ronson and a visit to his shtetl. Was this the case, or do you believe this is actually something he'd been contemplating for a long time? No, I don't think he had. I mean, I think, you know, actually it was sort of happenstance that Gerald Ronson, who was kind of a friend of, of Maxwell, insofar as Maxwell had friends, which he didn't really, um, but he, uh, Gerald Ronson, I think, was more of a friend than, than most people. And Ronson just happened to say, uh, you know, you're, you're Jewish, come to Israel, because he, he was flying to Israel, I think, in his private jet. And Maxwell said, oh, all right, and went along rather half-heartedly and then had this kind of, sort of like a kind of colossal epiphany when he arrived and was overcome with... I think a lot of kind of banked up survivor guilt that he'd really kept at bay for years and years and years. He pumped huge amounts of money into Israel to such extent, you know, to the extent that people were driving around Tel Aviv with bumper stickers saying, please, Mr. Maxwell, buy me. Um, in terms of Mossad, um, you know, there's been a lot of suggestions that Maxwell was bumped off uh, with Mossad being kind of generally reckoned to be kind of heading the queue. Um, there, are no, there are large numbers of people who are probably only too happy to bump Maxwell off, certainly by the, the, that stage. But there's no compelling evidence that he was murdered. Um, in terms of him actually working for Mossad, I, I, I think the idea that Maxwell by this stage was a kind of paid up agent of any power doesn't really hold water. But what he loved and flattered his vanity enormously was to be a conduit passing, you know, useful bits of information from Britain to the Soviet Union at the time when, of course, there were very, very few Western business people who had anything like the links behind the Iron Curtain that Maxwell did. And he would I think feed information to Mossad and probably, you know, information would come back. Um, but there's, you know, there's a number of books about how Mossad bumped him off. Well, one in particular, actually, but, um, and I, to me, it simply didn't stack up. You know, if, if people can provide me with compelling evidence that Mossad or anybody else you know, assassinated Max. So I'm only happy to keep an open mind about it, but you know, it just doesn't make sense. So I think the reason he got his state funeral was that he had enormously, um, you know, uh, uh, he had contacts with all the key players in Israel. He pumped a huge amount of money into the country and he wanted to be buried. On the, you know, he'd reserved himself a burial plot on the Mount of Olives. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Um, I think that more than answers the question. The next questioner, and I hope you're already unmuted, Anthony Gould. Um, if we can go to Anthony Gould, because I think you met Maxwell on a number of occasions and have stories as well as a question. Um, if we can reach you, Anthony yes, Gould. Yes, I'm here, if you Good. can hear me. Over to you. you. Yep. Good evening and thank you. Fascinating this has been for me because I had very extensive experience of East-West trade. So I became an advisor to the Thatcher government. And whenever dignitaries and ministers came over from Central and Eastern Europe, Margaret Thatcher would host lunches for them at Lancaster House. Now, uh, whenever it was Czech or Slovak minister in, in those days, they'd invite Maxwell. Now, I remember one occasion where Maxwell just took over the meeting, talked over Margaret Thatcher as if she was a junior person at the meeting, and also spoke to the guests in Czech and Slovak, which meant unless you spoke those languages, you had no idea what was being said. And you can imagine how Margaret Thatcher felt at, on these occasions. But I had a real problem. The company I worked for was a major supplier to both Murdoch and Maxwell. Ah. Um, and uh, I got involved in setting up Wapping with Murdoch. And it, you had to steer a very careful line if you were involved with one or the other of them. I remember that. But on one occasion... Um, it would appear that Maxwell used to host dinners at the mirror, in the mirror room at Claridge's. And I got invited to one of those. And he'd just taken on uh, Peter Jay as his chief of staff. And he treated him like a serf yeah, yeah, because yeah. he'd been a naughty boy in Washington and then TVAM had gone wrong. And I, I couldn't believe how he treated him. But the idea was he saw himself as a Cecil King, mm. he, he was going to improve relations between East and West, and he wanted to have a conference. And he'd got the Czechoslovak ambassador there. He said, you can look after the political side of things. And he wanted me to leave the company I was working for and take over running and, and getting sponsors from business. And I was very clear to him that I wasn't prepared to do that and he was a big man and he didn't like people saying no and he came over towards me and I thought he was going to punch me on the nose and I suddenly remembered a joke that I'd told him a long time ago told it and he just I think he was drunk he just guffawed turned round and never tackled me again so I got away with that but my question to you now is if today you had a character like this, would you treat him as a candidate for megalomania, narcissism, and who needed psychiatric help rather than constantly criticizing and attacking him? I think that, I, I think that <laughs> the, the trouble is, I think it's inconceivable that Maxwell could have been persuaded to take any form of therapy unless he'd been kind of sectioned and strapped down. I mean, you know, you know to, to go into therapy, you've got to acknowledge that there's something wrong with you. And Maxwell, who I don't really think had an introspective bone in his body, but I think was kind of terribly confused by what was happening to him and his world as it were in the last kind of two or three years of his life when things were falling apart i just i think he was just utterly baffled by it and 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 would kind of cloister himself away in you know his apartment at the top of maxwell house and you know gorge himself on chinese takeaways and watch old clint eastwood movies and uh whilst the kind of the world raged around him um and i think that you know there is a story about how uh 
it, you know, in the Russian coup, you know, he can't believe that Yeltsin would kind of jump up onto a you know, Russian tank and make a speech, uh, you know, without consulting him first. You know, I think there must have been a part of him that realized that he was being left behind. And that his day had kind of come and gone. Um, so, you know, there are, but the trouble is, you know, there are a lot of people still out there, very much out there, who plainly are in pressing need of, you know, psych, you know, psychotherapy and, you know, possibly God knows what kind of treatment. Um, but they're not going to get it unless they want it. And then invariably they never do want it. The questions are coming in thick and fast. Oh. So can, can we turn now to Gerald Raingold, who should also be unmuted? Gerald, are you there? Can we hear from you? And if not, I'm going to move to someone else while you get up. No, I'm unmuted. Now Good. I want to, now oh, I but... suggest you'd like to see me as well. So I'll get my <laughs> video added. off. We'd love, to, we'd love to see you, Gerald. I'm just, I was just munching and my dinner as well, so... Uh, no, we don't want to see your dinner, but um, <laughs> far away. Um, yeah, um, well, my question really is that um, being um, in charge of one of the major international banks in London, um, yes, I did get involved with um, uh, Bob Maxwell, and um, he, he had to see me because the bank I was involved with had lent him money. And um, uh, he really saw me in that famous waiting room on the fifth floor of his offices in Holborn. And um, uh, as soon as he realized that he owed the bank I was responsible for money, he said to Kevin, you must look after Gerald. So my question really is, in your book, you don't really describe the issues a lot of the major banks had in the, in the last sort of three or four months before, the, before he died. Um, I just wondered if you were aware of that or uh, you, you know, well, I think. Um, go on. Oh, over to you, John. Yeah. Well, I think there are two answers I can give. That there's a kind of accurate one and a slightly disingenuous one. I there are a lot of bits of the Maxwell story that I left out. Um, so much so that I was kind of slightly puzzled when the book came out and it was referred to as a biography because it never i mean i know it sounds ludicrously naive thing to say i kind of thought well isn't a biography really because there's so much about maxwell's life that i didn't put in there's no stuff about football there's no stuff about british printing corporation and there isn't that much stuff about in forensic detail about the financial affairs so partly i did that because i wanted the narrative to be as as it were propelled as possible um and i suppose to you know to write a page turner but the other slightly more honest answer is that i am incredibly ignorant about financial affairs i mean ludicrously ignorant i was very very lucky that there was an extremely nice helpful couple who had worked on the financial times who guided me through Maxwell's financial affairs as if they were kind of holding the hand of a, you know, backward six-year-old. And at the end of it, I thought, okay, yes, I do pretty much understand this. Um, and I kind of took the attitude that um, the Tom Bauer has written two books about Maxwell, which are pretty much solely concerned with the financial side of it. And I kind of felt, well, you know, if people want to go there, they can read one of Tom's books. Um, and I'm going to try and do something different. That's not a very satisfactory answer to your question. No, but, I strongly but, suspect. 
All I'd say, John, is it was a wonderful book. I couldn't put it Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. But having met Bob and having met Uncle Bob, as you used to call him, and having poor Kevin, having been sort of told to look after me, uh, I got very much inside the family. So I, I love the book. Thank you very much. Indeed. Oh, thank you. And, and, and thank you for allowing me to say a few words. Well, oh, I'm God. sorry, we we didn't see you. Um, I, see, there... I can well, see I'm him. on now. I'm oh, on good. Now. There he is. Well, it's just me who's deprived. Um, <laughs> I'll have to find another another excuse, Gerald. Um, uh, can we turn to Eileen Rapoport? Um, Eileen worked as deputy treasurer of Maxwell Communications Corporation from. Um, 1988 until about 1992 with gaps in between for maternity leave and Eileen I think you're going to share a couple of anecdotes about your time working there are you ready and unmuted I think I am can you hear me yep. absolutely yep. excellent well uh, thank you John also I found the book also not putable down and I've had very many late nights or rather oh, that's, thank late you nights in order to complete it in time. It was an extremely good read. Right. Um, I, I'm going to try and paint a sort of visual image of my personal exposure to Robert Maxwell. And as you say, so many people have got uh, different stories and showing different signs of him. I was employed as deputy treasurer in 1988 at Maxwell Communication Corporation. So your book's very heavily relates to the Mirror Group. I was not a Mirror employee. I wasn't in the Mirror building. I probably only entered it a handful of times in my entire time there. So I was on the seventh floor of the octagonal building yeah. of Maxwell House in New Fetter Lane, albeit only yards away from the Mirror building. I was interviewed by, well, I had a first interview with the then treasurer. There wasn't a depth treasurer. And I had my second interview with Robert Maxwell himself. Um, and he was very accommodating. He saw I had French on my CV, which was clearly foolish of me, and decided to do part of the interview in French, which was horrifying because my French was certainly not fluent. But basically, he was um, very good and he employed me and he allowed me to do a part time arrangement nine to three so I could be a mother as well, which I think was not common practice at that point. Our offices in Maxwell House and the Treasury Department was on the seventh floor, and Maxwell and the directors, etc., on one floor above, on the eighth floor of this octagonal building. And on top of that was the helipad. Yeah. And even from our floor, two floors down, we could hear the helicopter land and take off um, uh, from that level. Um, in those days, in 1988, he had every, all his employees had an individual computer, which again, I think was not common practice. So he was, as you say, scientific, technical. He was very happy for, for us to be in an advanced state on that basis, um, which was, was very enjoyable. And anyway, I'm going to tell you two very short anecdotes, which sort of, in a way, are quite contrasting. But um, in my early days there, um, oh, one, one of many occasions he would ask me to prepare a report or something on his finances, on, on the company's finance, not his finances. Um, and I would have to take them up to his office. And although I know both from your book and other people's experiences of waiting sometimes for hours outside, I don't recollect being kept waiting for hours, never mind you know, overnight, I think, in one instance in your book. Um, but you entered this office, which was absolutely enormous. Um, I would guess it was 35 foot long. So you'd come in uh, through one door at one end and he'd be sitting at his, I think it was a round table right at the other end. And you had to make this decision whether you stood by the door having got in and sort of bellowed down this very long room or had an extreme level of confidence to walk straight in and march right to the other end up to his desk or somewhere hover in between. And that took a lot of confidence actually. And he was very intimidating. And of course he had a huge advantage over you sitting down this very large man and you're standing there looking rather sort of scared basically somewhere in the room. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, on, the, on one occasion, I think it was really one of my very first visits I went up there to take something he required. I must have gone up to his desk because I remember handing it to him. And then 
turned around to leave the room and then panic stricken. I couldn't remember which door I'd come in through. And I'm not renowned for my sense of direction at best. And quite honestly, I had, was clueless. There were several doors to the room. And the first door, of course, I chose, thinking it was my exit room, was a cupboard. And I think he just enjoyed, he could easily have given me a guide, a steer as to how to get out of the room, not a bit of it. He let me make a fool of myself, basically walking into this cupboard. And I can't have to say I couldn't wait to get out of that room um, as fast as possible. And that, that was very unnerving. And I said, I'm sure, sure. He, he took pleasure in that. But then on a sort of completely contrasting story, within a matter of months of joining him, um, I, I took my twins, they were five-year-olds, um, showing them how to fly a kite, fell over and broke my wrist. And I was in Plaster of Paris and couldn't drive. And he volunteered, and certainly wouldn't have dreamt of asking him, to give me one of his chauffeurs for the whole six weeks I was in Plaster to leave the office at three, at the end of my part-time hours, to go home via not one school, but two schools, pick up my daughter in one preparatory school, my son in a second preparatory school, and drive the three of us home to North London. And he did that, you know, he provided the chauffeur for me for every day for six weeks. Yeah. But have to, you have to you know, decide no, that. Really very no, generous, no, very absolutely. thoughtful. And you know, clearly something I had not asked for. So I say overall, I had a very good experience working there. We had opportunities to do things I wouldn't have had in many other companies, not just access to computers, but the treasury field um, was, you know, an open book and he was, you know, allowed us to come up with new ideas and he was very open-minded, as you can imagine, actually. Um, yes, he was intimidating. Yes, he was controlling. Um, but overall, it was a very good experience. And I did leave, as Anne rightly pointed out, on maternity leave and came back in March 91, not in my role as deputy treasurer, but right. to support the treasury department in leasing and foreign exchange swaps and bits and pieces that they needed help with. And I was in the office on the day he went missing. And I have to say, I have very strong memories of that there was a frisson and a shock that permeated across all the staff who were on that floor in, in the office. Not one of good riddance, not one of, you know, just sheer terror, which yeah. I expect is perhaps is not so surprising because we, you know, we didn't even know he was dead at that point, simply missing you know, this larger than life image who had dominated most people's working life there, in some cases for many years, in my case, a very short period of time. And, and I wasn't exposed to him so often that I felt dominated by him in any case. Um, but it was simple shock that sort of you know, stunned everybody, and we, you know, not surprisingly. Um, and and then, of course, I, I was employed until 1992, January only, which is when a whole lot of us left the company, um, and they just kept on a handful of people to help with some of the investigations. So clearly, a lot of things surfaced between that November shock day and by the time I left, and, and a lot more after that. But I mean. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to um, pick you up on that because uh, before we run out of time completely, there have been a number of questions um, to you, John. Uh, uh, and thank you so much for sharing all of that about the end. And was it suicide? And what's your view? So um, perhaps you can well, just talk <clears throat> a little bit about your view of, of his, his ending I think that by there's no doubt that by the end of October 91, Maxwell knew the game was up. And he went off on board the Lady Ghislaine. Uh, he announced at very short notice that he wanted to come on board the boat. It's the only time he's ever been there without this kind of retinue of uh, mirror executives or various people who work for him. Um, he was alone. He was very accommodating to the staff. He ate the same food as they did. And they cruised rather aimlessly around the Canary Islands for a few days. And Maxwell knew that he was due to fly back to London on the morning of November the 5th, which was a Tuesday. And he knew that he was going to really be effectively facing three firing squads as soon as he got back. 
The fraud squad were after him, the banks were after him, and the mirror pensioners had worked out there was a colossal hole in the pension fund. So when Maxwell goes missing at about three o'clock in the morning on the, on the Tuesday, um, if it is an accident, it's a very fortuitous accident in a way. Um, and my feeling is, as I've said, I don't think he was murdered. I think you can create an equally convincing case for saying he committed suicide or it was an accident. And indeed, of the people that I interviewed for the book, they pretty much divided down the middle um, in terms of the people who favoured, as it were, uh, suicide and people who thought it probably was an accident. Rupert Murdoch, for instance, was, remains absolutely convinced that Maxwell committed suicide. No glimmer of doubt at all in his mind. Um, my feeling is that actually the, the line between suicide and an accident is possibly less distinct than we tend to assume. And I feel that the answer lies somewhere along that line. I don't think he necessarily set out to commit suicide. But at the same time, I don't think it was necessarily a complete accident either. Uh, I think the fact that Maxwell locked um, his cabin door, he disappeared over the, over the, the back deck of the Lady Ghislaine, uh, which um, his cabin was the only part of the boat that had access onto the back deck. Um, he had gone out there, he'd locked the door um, and they never found the key. So the assumption is that the key probably went overboard with Maxwell. And that would seem to suggest that he wanted the crew to think that he was inside the cabin for as long as possible so they wouldn't raise the alarm. Um, on the other hand, he had very badly torn uh, muscles in one of his shoulders, which suggested that he had certainly tried to cling on to um to the boat at some stage and then presumably his weight uh was too great and he just couldn't hold on any longer um you know did he step over the rail um with a view to throwing himself off and then change his mind which mm -hmm. was entirely possible you know the short answer is i don't know but I do feel that it wasn't wholeheartedly suicide and it wasn't wholeheartedly an accident. That's the that's best a, answer I can give. I think that's a brilliant answer. Um, I'm going to throw two questions at you at once to wrap up, if you can possibly answer them briefly. Um, can you say any more about Maxwell's role in procuring arms in Czechoslovakia for the Haganah during the Israeli War of Independence? And um, what really motivated him? Was it greed or was it the feud with Rupert Murdoch? I know they're not the same, but... <laughs> uh, the, first, the, the first question is, again, this is something that the evidence is pretty flimsy. And I didn't put anything in about it simply because it didn't entirely stack up for me. Other people might be able to make an infinitely more convincing case. Um, as to what motivated Maxwell, I'm not sure if he, if he ever knew. Um, I think he thought he knew um, that he certainly wanted probably more than anything else status. He wanted to be needed. Um, as I said before, I don't think the money was of paramount importance. I think it's fascinating that he really, I think he did own the house in Isha actually, uh, but that, if he did, it was the only house I think he ever owned. Um, I think that he needed to be needed and revered. 
Why did he need that? Possibly, just possibly, um, because there was something about himself that he didn't value sufficiently and wanted the validation of other people's value projected onto him. That is my attempt at amateur psychology and possibly, you know, fit to be laughed out of court. Nonetheless, that is my feeling. Can you very briefly tell us, did Maxwell ever acknowledge the comic banality of choosing the name Maxwell House? No, because Maxwell, I think, you know, it's a moot point whether Maxwell had that much sense of humour. But I mean, I think he did to some extent, but he certainly had no sense of self-absurdity because, you know, you couldn't uh, if you'd done the things he did. And then, of course, it's fascinating that in terms of sort of crazed self-aggrandizement, there's quite a kind of short line, as it were, between Maxwell House and Trump Tower. And indeed, Trump was kind of in awe of Maxwell to some extent. Um, so I don't think he saw anything of anything absurd about himself at all. And like a lot of people with no sense of self absurdity, he was particularly susceptible uh, to ridicule. Um, so I think that mm, a sense of humor just about ridicule, no, but like a lot of people weirdly with no sense of, of self ridicule, very funny things happened around Maxwell. Well, I, I just um, loved, loved, loved the book and I've loved hearing you talk more about it. And for any of you who are in doubt, there is lots more in the book and talking of comic interludes. I mean, the story of the Japanese dip philanthropist who, who is prostrate before the queen and has to be explained and practically dragged away. I mean, it's worth buying the book just for that scene alone. So anyway, I'm now going to just say a huge thank you, John, no, and hand you. over to Michael, who's going to um, wrap up and thank everybody for their wonderful technology and tell you where you can go and buy the book and how. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you both. Many thanks. Firstly, if I can say to all those watching tonight that's provided us with a re record audience on Zoom of some 270 and even more than that on YouTube. So we've never had as many as that, John and Anne. Fantastic. <laughs> so we're indebted to you. Um, and also the questioners and their anecdotes, particularly from people who knew him personally. Um, my appreciation also to my colleagues who made this evening happen, um, but it's so much easier to have both a brilliant book and speaker as John Preston. So thank you, John, for giving us your time tonight. And I hope that those who haven't yet bought the book will do so tomorrow, as Anne said, while you'll be able and you'll be you'll be able to buy a signed copy for the bargain price of 13 pounds 99 including postage and packing which is even less than amazon and that's from the independent open book bookshop in richmond as is advertised on the poster yeah. um and our appreciation no less to you, to you Anne, for giving us your time in the busy run-up to the publication next month of your yeah. biography. Yeah. Uh, Ethel Rosenberg, the only woman killed by the American government for a crime other than murder and following a trial riddled with miscarriages of justice. What did occur to me during this talk is the um, what you have in common, which is the amount of original research ah. that you both obviously go into and possibly why it takes so long, really, from the time that you start on these books to the time it comes out. But that's, that, that really is, to my mind, the key of what you both do. Um, and we're very much hoping that uh, Anne is going to give us a talk on, on her book in the autumn. We've got a variety of events over the next few months, over one including Kabbalah,
another defending Israel legally from a leading human rights lawyer, an internationally known historian about his new biography, uh, the Sir Jack Cohen story from a member of his family, and last but not least, um, another Sir Michael Burton play, this time on the Winslow Boy. Um, for those of you who missed any part of this talk, it's recorded on the Wimbledon YouTube channel. Um, and many thanks once again, and I look forward to seeing you all in the very near future. Thank you John, very much. I waited very patiently, if I may Thank take you. a moment. John, if I may take a moment, I've waited very yes. patiently. Um, I was very friendly with Maxwell's executor, um, somebody, uh, a solicitor, um, who did tell me that um, he... Have you gone? No, I'm here. Okay. The reason he was buried in Israel is because he bought the spit... Excuse me. Uh, he bought the spitfires from the Czech uh, Air Force <clears throat> in 1947 and gifted them to Israel and hence probably won the War of Independence. But he didn't have the money in 1947 to buy any Spitfires. Um, you'd be surprised. All right. OK, I'm happy to be convinced. Um, and he took the body to Israel for the burial. But um, I sold um, a company, my own company, to him in 1989 because of my business relationship with a firm of solicitors. And um, every company that was mentioned in the uh, investigations was a company that I formed on behalf of the Maxwell Corporation. And um, I spent a year in their employment. And I can tell you, um, a twisted skein of wool was less complicated than oh, I'm sure. the Absolutely. organization of the Maxwell organization. So thank you very much. No, thank you. A legend in his lifetime, probably a legend <laughs> after his lifetime. Well, okay. goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for thank inviting you. me. All thank right, you. then. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you.